Hello, my name is Tracy McGregor. I'm an instructor with EMS University. I presently teach CPR and first aid. I've been involved with CPR instruction for about four years. I've been a nationally registered EMT since 2005, and I've been involved with the fire and EMS system for 14 years. What we're going to discuss today is seizures, which can be found in Lesson 4-4-3. Let's begin. <clears throat> The objectives of this presentation are to define what a seizure is, discuss the different seizure classifications, discuss common causes of seizures, and discuss treatments of the seizure patient. So what is a seizure? <clears throat> a seizure is a sudden and temporary alteration in brain function <clears throat> caused by massive electrical discharge in a group of nerve cells in the brain generally causes change in mental status, activity, and behavior. Seizures range from trance-like periods to unresponsive and jerking muscle spasms. Seizure classifications. Generalized and partial. For generalized seizures, this involves both hemispheres of the brain. This includes grand mal or tonic-colonic seizures or petite mal absence seizures. We're going to discuss some more in depth as we continue. Partial seizures include one hemisphere of the brain and this includes simple focal motor or Jacksonian seizures, complex temporal lobe or psychomotor seizures. For generalized seizures, as mentioned, this involves both hemispheres of the brain your primary seizures are caused by disease process like epilepsy or unknown etiology. Secondary seizures can be caused by some other process such as trauma, poisoning, etc. A good way to look at it in this perspective is they had a seizure secondary to being poisoned. So sometimes you may encounter patients who've been um, assaulted and Blunt force trauma may have been the cause. A secondary seizure may follow in suit. Also, with poisonings, you may want to consider certain things like environmental self-poisoning, such as a interaction with drugs, or excuse me, even a reaction with drugs, be it prescribed or illicit drugs. The tonic-colonic seizures, also known as grand mal seizures, the tonic phase, the muscles tone or stiffen, the colonic phase, the muscles start to jerk, and the seizure can usually last for around two to three minutes. Some other manuals will also say that the tonic-colonic seizures can last for up to five minutes with the postdictal state lasting for five minutes up to 30 minutes. Um, it's also characterized by increased salvation diaphoresis, hyperventilations, and tachycardia. So when the patient comes out of the seizure and goes into a postdictal state, one of the main keys you want to remember is to maintain an airway. <clears throat> In the phases of the seizure, you will have the aura phase. This is where the patient has an abnormal twitch, anxiety, dizziness, a smell or odor, or an unpleasant feeling in the stomach visual disturbances or an odd taste just prior to the seizure. They have also known to have incontinence, tongue biting, and they kind of go into a slight tonic phase, which the tonic phase is muscle rigidity, um, where you have the hypertonic phase, is an extreme case of this, where this also includes back arching. You have the colonic phase, which is the jumping phase of the seizure, so that's where the tonic and colonic come together, and then you have the postictal phase, which for all intents and purposes are 10 to 30 minutes in length. Other generalized seizures, an absent seizure, which is better characterized as a petite mal, this seizure usually causes a few seconds lapse of awareness, may be accompanied by the eyelids or eyes rolling back into the head. This may look like daydreaming or staring off into space, and the seizure can occur 50 to 100 times per day. Partial seizures. A partial generally does not impair consciousness. 
A complex partial seizure generally will exhibit some altered level of consciousness during and after the seizure. Both may progress into a generalized seizure, so take precautions. Classifying partial seizures. Simple partial seizures, also known as focal motor, focal sensory, or Jacksonian, include twitching or jerking of an arm or a leg, exhibiting an inappropriate sensation or emotion. These will typically last for 30 seconds. Complex partial, also known as temporal lobe or psychomotor, will exhibit auto matisms such as smacking one's lips, mumbling, wandering, picking at clothes, or repeating actions. Person is usually confused after the seizure. Some of the seizure conditions to keep cognizant of are epilepsy, which is a chronic brain disorder characterized by recurrent seizures. As mentioned before, if you have bystanders, typically which include family or friends, or somebody who knows the patient, they will typically be the first to identify that the patient is epileptic. Status epilepticus is a seizure that lasts more than five minutes in duration or seizures that occur consecutively without a period of consciousness. These can be quite scary uh, for first responders, primarily because the patients have, a t have tendencies to become apneic. So one of the things, as with all patients, you want to try to maintain the airway keep a patent airway, provide oxygen therapy, and rescue breathing as needed. Before we discuss this slide of common causes of seizures, I went ahead and referenced my uh, EMT manual, and I'd like to just cover it really quickly for all intents and purposes of the um, EMS CEUs. Some of the common causes of seizures um, are typically epileptic, structural, metabolic, and febrile. For epileptic, this is obviously congenital origin. For structural, you have um, a tumor which can cause seizures. This may be either benign or cancerous. Infection, which can cause brain absence. Scar tissue from an injury. Head trauma or from strokes. For metabolic, you may have hypoxia, abnormal blood chemical values, hypoglycemia, poisoning, drug overdose, sudden withdrawal from alcohol and medications. And with febrile, this can be caused from a sudden high fever. Now some of these we're going to discuss later on in the slideshows and especially with the present slide. However, I would like to have categorized them as epileptic, structural, metabolic, and febrile. So I hope that kind of clear, clarifies some things for everybody listening. Now, leading over to the common causes of seizure slide, high fevers, which are typically uh, seen in febrile, infections, poisoning, as I mentioned earlier, be, there, be it either environmental or um, an ingestion or an inhalant, Hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia, which in that case, if we suspect that, always take a blood uh, sample, depending on your protocols. Head injury, epilepsy, hypoxia, stroke, drug and alcohol withdrawal, dysrhemias, pardon me if I said that wrong, hypertension, eclampsia, which is involved with pregnancies, and idiopathic, which are unknown causes. So like I said earlier, uh, just a second ago, keep that in mind for the types um, as epileptic, structural, metabolic, and febrile. For febrile seizures, these are unfortunately very common. Convulsions are brought on by fevers in infants and small children. They will usually occur in children from ages 6 months to 5 years of age. So remember, when you're responding to a seizure call for a young patient, Unless it's a congenital issue such as epilepsy, the parents are either one going to say that the patient had a high fever, <coughs> or because with children who have had febrile seizures, it's more commonplace for reoccurrence, so the patient's parents may tell you that this has happened before. So try to gather that information with the sample history or the and or the OPQRST. 
The ranges in duration um, can be from seconds to 15 minutes. The majority of patients have rectal temperatures of greater than 102 degrees. And one of the most important things to remember is it's not the temperature of the child, but how fast they get that temperature. Basic life support for tre uh, treatment for patients includes BSI as always, seen safety, assess the responsiveness, try to assess their uh, level of consciousness, consider C-spine immobilization. If you suspect a C-spine compromise, never hesitate to put a C-collar on and backboard that patient uh, or use whatever you have. Open airway and suction is needed. As mentioned, uh, with some of the seizing effects, salivation is going to be um, very prevalent. So you want to maintain that airway, as always, because if that patient is um, choking on their saliva, that can be a big issue. So go ahead, feel free to suction that patient. And hopefully, by the time you arrive on scene, if the patient is still not seizing, Hopefully somebody will have put that patient in the recovery position or that patient is laying in that uh, type of position. Provide oxygen therapy as needed. Provide ventilatory support as needed. Uh, this includes rescue breathing if needed. Sometimes, as I said, with um, status epilepticus, the patient may become apneic. So keep that in mind. Protect the patient for further harming themselves. Save the patient from harming themselves from themselves, if any of that makes sense. Um, as we all know with patients um, who are seizing, you know, you have these old wives' tales of putting a stick in their mouth and jumping on the patient, which I've seen out, out in the world before, and sometimes you just have to remind bystanders who are trying to help that they're really not helping. So try to clear the air, the clear the area around them and um, and try to protect their head as much as you can by placing a pad or a blanket um, or whatever you have that can protect that patient from harming themselves. In febrile seizures, attempt to cool the patient with tempid water, but be careful for reflex hypothermia. Transport the patient and consider an ALS intercept. Some of the special notes I'd like to discuss here are restraints of a patient. Sometimes people tend to think of this type of stuff as helping the patient, but as EMTs, we all know that this really isn't. As I mentioned earlier, when you have bystanders who are trying to help the patient, they just jump on the patient. You've got to remember when they're in the tonic stage, they have extreme muscle rigidity and then when they're in the colonic stage and their muscles are convulsing um, basically you have to let them work it out within themselves so instead of trying to restrain the patient uh, take a more sympathetic approach and as I mentioned earlier in the previous slide save the patient from themselves as much as you possibly can um, Before we complete this slideshow, I'd like to uh, point out a couple other things that can be useful to responders in the field. Uh, this is coming from my medical guide. Is Sometimes when you have a person who has seized and nobody has seen it or nobody knows how to recognize it, they may immediately go to a stroke or you know some type of syncopal episode. Sometimes people who are in post-dictal state will also dis, uh, display hemiparesis. So you may have a bystander who once worked in the medical field or somebody who may know a little bit about the medical field and immediately suspect that it's a stroke. Try to obtain this information via sample history and OPQRST. Sometimes you won't gather this information until after the post dictal state is nearing the end. Um, but some of the things you want to also consider with the post dictal state are some of the signs and symptoms. They're going to have labored breathing. They're going to be working to um, rid themselves of the acidosis, which is the buildup of the blood. They're going to be flaccid and floppy. They're going to look exhausted. Some of the things to consider when a, um, a stroke patient or correction, a seizure patient, comes out of the seizure is how much their body has been working. Um, 
they're going to be extremely tired and they're going to be diaphoretic and you know it's, their body has just done an entire workout within minutes so keep that in mind um, and with the hemiparesis <clears throat> this should typically resolve itself you know shortly thereafter however one of the things that we can never um, overlook is getting that patient rapid medical transport providing our interventions as BLS providers such as oxygen therapy respiratory therapy meaning um, rescue breathing and cardiopulmonary resuscitation is needed um, now I know these things typically get beat into the ground and I do apologize for being one of those people who are beating it in but always understand and know your protocols as BLS providers try to remain cognizant have your signs and symptoms of these types of emergencies. I hope this has helped you in obtaining further information with your EMT CEUs. Thank you for your time.